Alright, so let's go get started. Um, I got 68 slides to run through, which gives me 30 seconds per slide. That's my time for questions. So, um, so welcome to Component Based Saving the Twig, Pattern Lab. They all married, get married together. Um, my name is Chad Chumley. Um, you may have seen some of you in, in some of my trainings throughout the years. Um, this is a topic that's dear to my heart. Um, I've written a couple books on Drupal 8, um, one on Drupal 8 Thieving with Twig, another one on Mastering Drupal 8, um, and then um, if you have not know Mario Hernandez or Media Current, me and him are currently actually in the process of doing an outline for a pattern lab component-based thing with Twig book. Hopefully we'll have that out soon. And then if anybody finds the time to DrupalCon this year, me and Mario are actually teaming up to give the training at DrupalCon. So. Um, Things I'm going to talk about in today's session. Uh, pattern Lab and Twig. So there's really four different things that you really need to have a really good grasp on or understanding. Um, the first is patterns. Um, how to identify patterns. We see patterns all the time, whether in the wild, whether they're actually on your phone, whether they're in their design. And then how do those patterns map to what we call components and what makes up a component? What's the anatomy of a component? How do we identify those components? Um, and then how does that get managed with pattern lab? And then finally, how do we take all the lovely things that we've, as a front-end developer, have gotten in theming and putting into a component and managing in pattern lab, and how do we marry that with Drupal 8 and Twig? So, so patterns. Patterns to start with is kind of a simple concept, I think, to, to understand. Um, I mean, we can look around the room, like we can look at the, the ceiling tiles we see repeating pattern of things happening. Um, if we got into the wild, we can see, which is my favorite pattern, this is the zebra burger pattern. Um, the reason I call it zebra burger is because if the zebra is standing by himself, he's gonna be eaten by the prey. The reason zebras have stripes and the reason they have different patterns on them is so when they stand in a herd, they actually become almost blind to any type of prey that's taking a look at actually eating them that day. Here's another pattern. Go ahead and take a couple seconds here and uh, try to read through this. I guarantee that you probably, most of you at least read through this. So this is actually an example of how I type my code most of the days. <laughs> um, but it's very strange how like your mind is actually able to look at a particular pattern and, and switch things around in, in such a way that the pattern makes sense to you. Um, another type of pattern we see generally when we're looking at websites is a home page or a hero or a call to action. Um, something where our first time we look at something, we, we tend to try to kind of jump to a conclusion of, hey, I know exactly whether that is in, in the Drupal 8 world, that's a no. However, if I ask the developer or for an person next to you, they may say, no, that's a block. <coughs> Great. What if we're in Drupal 7? Maybe it's a panel, right? Maybe it's a field collection. If you think it's a field collection, there's the door, because field collections are evil. <laughs> um, However, you may be all right, you may not so identify things all correctly, but the challenge with this, especially in, in the old Drupal 7 days, is this led to what I would call old and busted or divitis, where we had all this markup that, that was being output to us that really made it complex for us to be able to think of things in such a way that made it even harder for us to be able to implement when it came to CSS. And so, this, this reminds me of a time where, when I actually was working with my CSS back in the Drupal 7 days, I often felt like you know, a code wrangler of being able to try to get my CSS into a specific method or into a particular div or a panel or a block. So often left to me feeling like, you know what, I'm just gonna take my CSS and throw it over here, because that's exactly how I felt um, and when we started theming stuff in Drupal. However, with Drupal 8, this concept, um, came to a point where we were able to really kind of take a step back. We can start looking at those patterns that we saw and kind of developing them into whatever the term the word component. And so the thing that you need to think about though when you're dealing with components is number one, we're not designing pages. 
Okay? We are designing a system of components. So when we look back at a design such as this, which could be on someone's homepage, again, it could be a hero, a call to action. We really need to like not look at the forest, so to speak, but we actually need to take a look at the tree because the tree can live different places throughout our site. And so being able to identify what actually makes up a component makes it much easier for us as front end developers to be able to start theming things. For instance, at the very top here, we have an H1, followed by maybe a paragraph tag, followed by maybe a teaser or a summary, followed by a button. So we start breaking out the larger components and not looking at it from a giant page standpoint, we can even start breaking these things out even further. And so we can actually say, well, all of my H1s on the side are going to look like this. All of my paragraphs or teasers are going to look like this, and all of my buttons are going to look like this. And what makes that possible is this concept of a component anatomy. So when you start looking at things, you start breaking down things, because it's normal for us to always put things in the boxes. So the process of identifying components isn't that challenging, but knowing how you're going to work with a component is something that you have to have, have at least the four understandings. Number one is the component by itself should be independent. So for instance, back on this page here, that H1 is, is independent. If I hid the teaser and I hid the button, it still can, has this context of being able to stand by itself. And the reason for that is it's clearly defined. We're all used to working with semantic HTML, H1 through an H6, a paragraph tag, a button. Those are all things that can stand by themselves. The other thing that makes this work really well is that they're clearly defined. Okay? We know what we're looking at. We know how they're going to interact. The third part of that is they're encapsulated. What does that mean? That means that I can take that H1, put it wherever I want. It's, it's built in such a way that, or at least I should be building it in such a way that I won't have to worry about specificity war taking place. If a client says, hey, I want that H1 to be orange and not white, I should have one place to be able to go change that, and regardless of where that H1 is being used throughout the site, I should inherit those changes that I make to it. It's encapsulated. And finally, it's reusable. So if we go back and take a look at this design here, H1, paragraph, button, all standing by themselves, but when I think about this as a component, maybe a hero or a call to action, I have the ability to take a component, in this case a button, and put it into another component. So it makes it reusable. And then I can take this larger component and keep building on it. So think of Legos and how you used to play with Legos when you were a child. So what makes this possible? How many people here are familiar with BIM? Okay. Good, good, good portion. So BIM is this concept of block element modifier. And this is what kind of really makes sure that if you're working by yourself or in a team of developers, that you're following a naming convention that makes sense and it actually really marries well with component-based design, especially with Padlet. And so this is a concept of block element modifier, which allows for HTML and CSS developers to better understand the relationship between the different components um, as well as the particular project. And so <clears throat> this follows this process of the block, in this case of that design we saw a minute ago, if we call that a hero or a call to action, again, naming things are hard. Um, that block is the top level abstraction. It has a parent div or a class of whatever you're naming. The elements inside it, in this case the H1, the teaser, the button, follow that naming convention of block, underscore, underscore, whatever that element is that you want to call the heading, summary, button. And then finally, we need to back up and kind of think about how we're working with these components because we have the ability with BIM to pass what we call modifiers to something. So imagine having a button that the client says, hey, I want it to look large on one page, but small on another page based off of the actual inherent component by itself. We can pass these modifiers, which allow us to manipulate the same block without having to duplicate the block multiple times. So we're able to follow that KISS and that dry principle that everybody always preaches to us about. And so the markup for a block looks you know, something like this. So in this case, we have a div with a class of whatever you decided to call that particular component, and we can target it very easily using SAS or CSS 
by referencing that component directly. If we start to add elements inside it, like a heading or a title or a button, and they follow this naming convention, it makes it really easy if you're going to have to jump from a project to another project, or if you haven't been using BIM and you start using BIM, it really makes sense of the naming convention because it's the name of the block, underscore, underscore, whatever that element is that's inside it. And again, it makes it much easier for us to target it in our SAS or CSS. And then finally, here's an example of a modifier with a variance. So, Variants follow the block name, dash, dash, whatever that variant is, big, small, blue, red. You just could really go, maybe have a, a hero that's basic or simple or complex. It look, look like three different heroes, but I can easily target it with these variants and then have a completely different SAS structure underneath. Then finally, I can nest components, okay? So this makes it really easy for me to take one component and then take another component and put it inside of that particular component. And so I don't have to think about completely restyling the component components and sitting inside it. It can take its exact state and then I can just nest them and keep going and building on these building blocks. So what does this allow us to do with this? Well, Drupal 8 really allowed us to be able to start writing much more semantic HTML. So in this case of that hero, I have a, a div with a classic hero, it has a background image, um, and you're starting to see some twig in here, but you can, if, if you're this is your first time saying twig. You just say, imagine those are replaced with hard static values. Um, inside there, I have a wrapper or container that handles my hero's content. And then there, I have an H1 with my hero title. I have another div with my hero text, which has my summary. And then notice here, I mean, this isn't hero underscore underscore button, and that's because this is a separate component that, again, Reusable, encapsulated, can stand by itself, is clearly defined, so I don't need to rename this. This should pick up the characteristics of what that button looks like. And I'll show you an example here. I'll open the pattern line a little bit, um, and you get a clear understanding. But it makes it very semantic for us to be able to start writing our markup the way that we've always wanted to, or either learned how to do to begin with. And in turn, it makes our CSS, or our SAS, much easier to read. We know that, hey, the hero has this, this particular pattern. I know that this, this maybe the case there's a horizontal rule here, or there's a teaser, um, and maybe it happens to be a paragraph on the inside here, so it picks up these characteristics. And so we're not having to worry about that divitis where we have all this crazy nesting taking place. Um, we can start doing things like lint and SAS linting. We can start making sure that we're not going more than a couple levels deep with our SAS. And it makes it much easier to be able to work with our components um, to identify components and six months down the line when you have to go back and look at your project again it's very easy for you to jump in and say yeah I know exactly what I'm looking at. So that's great. We got patterns, we have components, but how do we start managing these two or, or marrying these two together? And so this is where that concept of pattern lab comes into play. And so pattern lab by itself is just a tool that we can use that is often referred to as a static site generator. What it does is it allows us to combine a UI for our components and it gives us a way for us to be able to manage it. The nice thing about this is twofold. Number one, it allows sort of the back-end developer, maybe they already have the build specs in place, they can go and start doing the site building, but it also allows the front-end developer when the design's ready, and often, most cases I've seen, the design's ready before the client signed off on any type of I, IA or they're coming at you in parallel, allows for the front-end developer to go work at the same time as the back-end developer, and then you can come back in the middle and do the integration piece that uh, myself and Mario have done in training classes for folks. This is probably the most important point though, of using Pattern Lab. This Pattern Lab instance whether it's outside of your theme, whether it's inside your theme, like you have a gesso, um, emulsify, particle, and depending on which one you've chosen to use, it lives as a lit, serves as a living style guide. Okay, great. How does how does that help me? It, it helps twofold. It helps the developer, number one, have a place to be able to go look at all the components. That developer, or it's a backend developer, or front end developer, can then in turn point QA to a particular item in Pylon and say. Hey, the QA is. It also allows the developer to be able to do things like test for responsiveness, test for its accessibility, because it's static HTML generated CSS. There could be some JavaScript on top of it. The thing is, it hasn't been integrated into Drupal at this point, 
so the client can look at it as well and say, yes, that looks the way I expected it to look, it works the way I expected it to work, and then as you start taking these components and combining them together, you can get full looking um, stylized pages um, that mimic the um, design mock-up that they may have seen or signed off on. And so that's great. What does the structure look like from Kinda Lab? So from Kinda Lab itself, the structure is pretty simple. We have a sort um, let me back up a little bit. This is the latest version of Pat from Pattern Lab, if you haven't had a chance to work with this. is the node version um, that um, has take, since taken the source folder and ripped it out separate from Pattern Lab folder. Pattern Lab is your uh, compiled markup. Your source folder, however, is where all the work is being done. And so it's broken into some different types of structure. Um, Annotations, layouts, these two folders I have found literally on every single project I've probably worked on. Never had anything in them. There is documentation in Palette I have to tell you what you can utilize these for. The ones that we want to focus on for just for having basic understanding today's session is my data folder has a, a one or multiple YAML files in it that allow us to hold these key value pairs. So many people have done touch JavaScript at some point in life. I'm going to be able to done basic Drupal 8 theming at some point in the world. Okay. So we're all familiar with like keys and variables holding an object or keys and values. And so the YAML files is, is, a, is an example of what holds these key values in this. And whatever's in the data folder is global to your whole pattern lab project. Okay. In most cases, if you want to make sure your components are reusable, it's where you can actually pull them out of one project and drop them into another. Your components folder is also going to have a YAML file in it for the particular components that you're dealing with. Um, macros is a particular type of twig component that allows you to encapsulate some markup and logic into it and, and reuse it in such a way. For instance, the main menu in Drupal 8 is actually composed of a macro. It's a way to self-iterate on the component until it runs out of iterations to, to go through. So think of a menu with a sub-menu with a sub-menu, you know, because we all love building mega menus, right? <laughs> um, joking on that. Um, then meta is my header and my footer of Pattern Lab. Um, and then inside my Patterns folder is really where the magic's taking place. Um, Jet, this is an example of Gesso. Gesso out of the box gives you a very uh, unopinionated, responsive, accessible starting point for you to be able to start working on any type of Drupal 8 project that you want to have Pattern Lab implemented in. Pattern Lab in this case is actually part of the Gesso theme itself. You don't have to use the Pattern Lab, it'll still work, but it's there for you to be able to use. And so let's look, take a look at the component floor because that's really what we're talking about today is these patterns and components and how do we utilize these with um, Pattern Lab. So component itself really is made up of at least four files. You can add a fifth one in here if you're needing to add, add some sort of JavaScript interaction with it. Those four files are, are simply a SAS file that holds my styling, a markdown file, this allows us to provide self-documentation for the component, which comes in handy. The twig file, just think of HTML, the twig variables in there, you're replacing those with static values with these keys that are then coming from your YAML file. So what do those four files look like out of the box? So here's an example of the teaser component that um, comes out of the box with Jesso. And so, again, unopinionated. We don't care how you make the teaser component look, but we give you a same starting point. So it's documented at the top. This is a SAS file, and it's commented out. And then you're going to comment this out and start adding your styling. Then you can make your teaser look exactly in the way that you expect it to look. Inside my markdown file, for those that are hopefully familiar with Markdown, but those that are not, this is the format of a Power Markdown file that you expect it to be able to use. The element and title in, in this actually are printed out, which we'll see here in two slides later. Um, they actually kind of identify what the actual component is you're looking at. And then any variables, these will be twig variables that are inside this component, what the variable is, what it's expecting, and what it's being used for. And so we're self-documenting the component as we go along. And then we're, then we're down to just basic HTML. Okay, again, ignore each of variables in there. Everybody hopefully has written HTML, with a little CSS. And so it's very easy to understand what a component is. It's just mark, markup. So in this case, I have an article um, tag. 
It has a class of teaser, so this is where my dim is starting to take place. I've identified the block, okay? And then inside here, in this case, I have a very generic looking one because I'm not actually having to follow anything else when it comes to elements or children inside here. But it has an H2, that H2 has an anchor tag inside it that has a URL and title, which we'll see where those come from in a second. We also have a date variable and we have a summer, summary variable. What happens is when the, this is compiled down, these variables get replaced with the values that are inside it. So where do those values come from? They come from the component YAML file. Okay, so in this case, URL back in another page gets replaced with a hashtag. Title gets replaced with a string value of title. And if you're, when you're doing this on your project, if you change title to say something else, it'll print that out because this key holds this value. So key value pairs inside of title mode. Here's my summary. Um, um, for those folks that may have worked with YAML before, you may not have seen this possibly before, but this is a pipe character with a dash. What this does is says, hey, this key is going to hold this object, not a string, but this object. This mechanism gives you the ability to make sure that if you have actual markup in this, that it actually renders the markup and doesn't try to print the markup as an actual string value. So those four things inside that component folder, when all combined together inside a pattern lab, gives you the ability to, and this is the pattern lab structure, structure itself, allows you to go to, to like components, which is a drop down there, choose teaser, and then you actually get to see how everything is rendered, okay? So this is my actual component up here. I can see that title is a link, because it's blue, and it's actually printing out that value that was in the key of title. Okay, just they just have to be named the same with like this, this said Chaz and be printing Chaz. I have the date being printed out, okay, and that's coming from the state variable. I have the summary coming being printed out based off of the summary. So that is my component with the SAS and the YAML being utilized, and the markdown file then gives me the self-documentation that's over there on the left-hand side. So this makes it really nice, especially if you're working in a larger team environment, or think, maybe think the project is already done and you're working with a larger organization, and that organization, you because you follow their branding guidelines, they now have a place to point other people to. Okay, Maybe somebody wants to build an application for them. They can say, here, here's the URL to my pattern lab library. This is the branding colors I want you to follow. This is the typography. If you're building a teaser in the app, it needs to look like X. They can go as far as you can see right here. I can see what the twig is, but there's also an HTML. They can click on the HTML and literally copy that HTML right out of there, and then they have that. And as long as they grab the SAS file or their CSS file, they'll have that actually component already generated for them. Any questions on components? All right. You will spend 90% of your time on any project developing these components or building these components. Over a period of time though, hopefully, because we can only create a hero so many times, we can only create a call to action or a button so many times, you'll start generating almost like this library of your own that I would recommend you putting into like a global pattern lab library. What's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is you should be able to, on the next project, if it has a hero that looked like what we saw in the previous, in the previous um, Vixel page, if it looks similar to that, maybe the only thing that's changing is the background color or the color of the text, guess what? The markup itself generally is not going to change. It's going to be the same semantic HTML structure. I can go reach to that other project, pull that whole component folder out of it, drop it into this project, and as soon as Bolt compiles my SAS for me, it's going to already be there for me. Now I just make my little small styling tweaks, and I've saved myself a whole heck of a lot of time. So this is the power of components, because they're self-contained inside that folder I can put grab them and put them into whatever project I want to be able to use. After you start building up this library of components, now it's on to what I would call Lego time. The template and a page. So a template is going to have two files. So think of your template as like a wireframe. It's not going to have the header. It's not going to have the footer. It's just like that node <coughs> by itself if, it's, if it could stand alone. So this template's going to have two files. It's going to have a twig file, which is my actual HTML markup. 
along with any key value pairs that Twig is going to actually output, and then my YAML file of allowing me to replace those keys with whatever values I've identified. So in this case, we actually have a template, um, and this is a template that um, out of the box comes with um, Gesso, and is utilizing some more advanced Twig stuff. And so if, if you're not familiar with some of these things, let me go and explain them to you real quick. There are Three, and I'll go into more detail in a second, but there's three ways for you to be able to actually reach into a component, whether it's a layout component, whether it's a physical component, and reuse those, whether it's in Pinelab or reuse them whether they're inside of Drupal. And that's using an include, an extends, or an embed. In this scenario right here, we are seeing two of those options being used. First, we have an embed. An embed also is doing is saying, hey, Go find my sidebar.twig template or file. It's inside my sidebar folder inside of my layouts folder. This at sign at layouts, kind of smart enough to go look through that source uh, structure that we saw earlier. Go find anything that's called layouts. The first one calls in, it's going to look for sidebar, and it's going to reach in and grab that sidebar.twig file, pull any markup with it. It's also going to allow me to pass any key values to it. So override what's in there generically to begin with. And then this right here, this block main with the M block, this is a concept called twig blocks. Not to be confused with Drupal blocks. I wish they would have named it differently, but one place or the other. But twig blocks allow me to say, hey, grab all the markup that's around this from this template, but allow me to replace whatever you had in that template inside here with whatever I have. And so in this case, we have two inputs. We have one grabbing a page title, passing a page title to it. We have another one calling a section element and passing the page content to it. So those keys that you're seeing on there, just like a component, have corresponding YAML values. So in this case, we have a page constraint which is empty, which means that when this prints out, it'll bleed from edge to edge. It's not constrained at all. The page title actually gets changed to actually say page title. My page content just prints out some more ipsum. And so when I go to look at those together, this time instead of looking at components, I'm clicking on the templates um, menu item here, selecting page, and so I can actually see what's being rendered. Notice there's no markdown file with this. You could have markdown, generally you don't because at this point we're kind of thinking like a wireframe approach. Okay? I can see the page title, I can see my lower MIPS, and I can see it's full bleed edge to edge. I do have the twig and the HTML tabs here so I can kind of see what, what's there and what's being generated. But this allows us to start taking those Legos or those components and start putting them together to form the template. Any questions on template? All right. The last kind of puzzle piece of this and when we're working inside of Pattern Lab is this concept of page, okay? Not a, not a basic page, but actual pages so what's the difference between a template and a page? The page now actually takes and pulls in the header, pulls in the footer, and then pulls in that template that was on the previous template structure. And so now we should be able to see like a full page that look, should look similar to whatever it is that you were designing or the designer handed to you that hopefully the client signed off on. It as well only has two files. It has a twig file and the animal file. So we're starting to see a pattern here. Apologize kind of small here, but we have an embed taking place again. There's my header getting pulled in. There's my footer getting pulled in. And then inside my main section, um, I'm passing this gener generic region to uh, mimic what the message uh, highlight region looks like in Drupal, same with the breadcrumb. But here's where I'm actually referencing that template page that twig file and passing um, YAML file variables, key values to it. And so, we'll see here in the yellow file, this is gonna have completely different static content than what was seen from the um, template page. In this case, we are saying, hey, we have this body class because now we're looking at this in the page level, so we're kind of passing or mimicking like some of the things we, that Drupal would generate for us. But in this case, we're saying, hey, the page constraint I'm passing this class got L, cons L constraint. So now when we look at this in a second, it's no longer gonna be full bleed, it's gonna be constrained based off of the max page width you specify. The page title, it says, look, I can take you as far as anchor head, and the page content drops in some good old Star Wars 
quotes for you. So when we look at this all together, we're able to see the twig file and what's been generated. Okay. In this case, we haven't themed these particular regions here that are getting pulled in, but there's the header, there's the highlight, there's the breadcrumb, and if I drop this down a little, you'd see something saying footer content. But here I can see the page title is completely changed. I can see the uh, the content that's kind of coming here. And just because I was trying to make sure the screenshot actually fit on the page, there is a constraint there. If I pull this out further, you can actually see more of the constraint, but it's actually being constrained from the page now based off of what I set it to be. Okay, so components, templates, pages, components, again, is where we're going to be spending most of your time. Templates is where we're going to be kind of putting together the rough just body or main section of it. And then your pages, we're going to bring them all together to actually hopefully look like what you're expecting it to look like. And this is kind of where the QA process comes into play, where if you have someone that's doing QA, they generally don't like to look at it from the individual component level. Oh, and FYI, when we're developing the components, we're developing those as full width, so we're actually developing mobile first. We're not developing desktop and then saying, oh, I want this break button, we'll go and do all these things. We're doing it the opposite way out of the box with desktop. Um, since QA doesn't like to look at things from a component level, I found that what works well is if you have, if you're not playing jack of all trades on a particular project, you actually have a designer that's working with you. You, from a component level, you can have the designer go QA the component, make sure that's what, it, what it's supposed to look like. And then when you get to the page level, you can just give the pattern lab link to the QA person. And if you want to wait till everything's integrated, you can give them both the pattern lab link and the Drupal page that corresponds with it, so they can kind of say, yep, those look exactly like I'm expecting. So this is all great, but what is the one thing <laughs> that Drupal 8 does not understand out of the box? Anybody? What is Drupal 8's twig called? Dot HTML dot twig. So, while I made the blanket statement six years ago, the Drupal 8 is 30% more awesome. <laughs> it actually was failing in one critical area, and that was how do we integrate this with Python? There's this DrupalCon Austin, I believe. Um, it was myself, it was Adam Duran. There, this concept of marrying Python Lab and Drupal 8 wasn't really happening yet. People were thinking about it, but still trying to figure out how it was. And so we walk into a, how many people have been here to a DrupalCon? Oh, yeah. Average room size of DrupalCon in most cases, if it's a popular topic, is I have 100, 150 people. Me and Adam walk in, it's two ballrooms, completely wide open, 475 people in there, and we both are like, I've been a DJ for 30 years, and I'm afraid to get in front of people. When I saw 475 people, I was like, what's going on? What was going on was, we had hit the nail right on the head. Everybody was thinking about this. Nobody was talking about it. And so at the end of this conversation that took place, because there was this issue at the time, we were, had a gulp task that was saying, hey, go take all that stuff from that page template, copy and paste it over into Drupal's.html.twig version. What was the one thing I was doing wrong at that point? Wasn't following dry, wasn't following kiss. If I had to change something, I had to go two different places to change it. John Alvin comes up to the microphone and says, hey, why are you guys doing the copy and paste? And I said, because Drupal doesn't understand what dot twig is. So I can't directly include that into Drupal and have it render it without getting a white screen done. Three months later, Component Libraries module came out by John. Thank you, John, for that contribution because what it allowed us for you to do is to do something like what we're seeing here on the left-hand side, which is a mapping. It allows us to say, hey, this is where you'll find this stuff. And then the second part of what this module does is it allows for Drupal to understand not only what that HTML twig is, but what dot twig is as well. So by doing this, we are able to have these mappings. We saw, if you can remember back in a couple of previous slides, we saw something where it said, hey, go embed at layouts. Well, layouts here, if I have an app from it in my tweet, it actually goes and says, oh, I know what layouts is. Here's the path, and knows exactly where to go find 
that particular template or the component that I'm dealing with. And so this is what kind of really picked it up a notch. And so uh, form one at the time, um, which is what you're always at, um, as well as um, media currents, phase two, or kitchens, zip tech. Everybody was kind of in the same, mind, same mindset. And so we started seeing these pattern lab integrated themes come out. And so the nice thing about that is it was allowed us to do two things. Number one, it allows for pattern lab to be the canonical source of Drupal's markup. Because we've already done all the hard work over in pattern lab, we don't have to copy and paste stuff anymore. We can just point to the file. And because we're already replacing key value pairs, when we pull this into Drupal, all we're doing is saying, hey, instead of passing a static value to that, pass content dot whatever the field name is. And so now we have that dynamic data that we're passing to the key. So now we're getting on Drupal side all the markup, all the SAS, all the interaction that we're expecting to, in the way that we're expecting to look, utilizing the canonical source over in Kylo. It's allowed us to then follow this process of dry or don't repeat yourself. <clears throat> when you start doing this type of integration, if, if you go and take a look at Emulsify or Particle or Gesso, um, there's three things you're going to want to make sure you do. This is common Drupal 8 theme 101, is make sure you have Twig Debug enabled. Those can be done by um, making a couple changes in your settings, that local.php and your local services YAML file. Um, once you have that, you have like following suggestions and stuff like that. A couple of things I want to point out though, so if you decide to use Gesso as a theme, which I highly recommend you do if you're going to do any type of title app, um, is number one, it's I'm going to keep going to point this out. It's accessible out of the box. We've already fixed some issues that Drupal 8 are not accessible out of the box in this theme with some inputs and some preprocesses for you. It's 100% responsive out of the box. Can you break both those things? Of course, if you're not following, making sure things are responsive, you start thinking things or making sure it's accessible, but you have a very good same starting point to use. And this is not meant to be a gesso sales presentation, but I just have a strong, firm believer in what's been done in this particular theme. In this theme, though, we have a region that we've added called hidden. Great, why do we have a hidden region on the block layout page? What it does is it allows us to, with a module like twig tweak and twig field value, be able to actually take and any blocks that are added to that block layout and put in, in the hidden region, we can actually print these out inside a particular template in Drupal and pass that over timeline. So I can reference a block with its machine name just by printing out Drupal entity. So this makes it very handy because then I can start utilizing the block templates with the pattern lab integration <coughs> to be able to pass things back and forth. I can do my wiring here and then on the template just reference that particular block. A couple things to know though when you start going down this path of, of taking these patterns and these components in pattern lab is that you're going to run into a couple areas, and we've already kind of addressed this for you, but just to know, off of, you know, for first-hand knowledge, menus have multiple templates, okay? Menus not only have the menu template itself, but also has a block wrapper template around it. And so make sure you know how things are being used. Again, back to includes, extends, and embeds. If you haven't worked with this before, people often say, well, what's really the difference between an include and extend embed? Why can't I just use one for everything and not to worry about the other two? You're going to find certain scenarios where you may want to use one over the other. So this is really the, the quick and dirty ex explanation of what these are. So an include tag is useful for including a Twig template okay, and then returning the rendered content. However, it allows us to use this with keyword to be able to pass those key value pairs to it. So this is where we can take, Pattern Lab can have its own content, and when we pull this into Drupal, we can utilize Drupal's content by passing those key value pairs that with keyword. And extends is a tag that can be used to extend templates the same way an include can. However, you cannot use the with keyword with it. But you can use that twig block. If you remember back in the previous template, we saw block main. Um, we have our block content, our block header, our block footer, what are, what the quick blocks are up to you to however you want to name them. But an extend allows us to pull out that content and replace what's in there. And then an embed is kind of the best of both worlds. 
an embed allows us to be able to combine both the behaviors of an include and extends because an embed can have a width, key value bear, uh, pairs passed to it. You can also have multiple twig blocks. And unlike an extend, you can actually have multiple embeds inside of a single template because it has a closing end embed tag with it, whereas extends doesn't, include doesn't. So what's an example of what those look like? So in this case, let's say I am sitting inside the mini.html.twig template in Drupal that comes out of core, and I want to reference the Panel Labs version of it. I simply just say, hey, drop it. Delete everything that's in there and just say include, add components. So this goes and looks at that mapping that we had in our info file and knows exactly where to go look. And then looks at the menu folder, and then looks at menu.twig and prints that out. What's another example of using include? Another example is with a page tile. Okay, we have a page tile block. We also have a page tile, which is the label inside of notes. I don't know why they called it label. <laughs> um, however, we can actually reference our version of a page title that's inside the time lab by using include, and then here's an example using the with keyword to be able to say, here's my key called page underscore title, here's my value from Drupal, which in the block, in the block template is content title. If we were to use this in a node, we'd be actually passing the page title later. Okay, so those are two examples of an include being used. Finally, an extend. So an extends, um, again, does not have that with keyword. You can generally find this used in the layout templates inside of Drupal for like the regions. So here we're actually extending and pulling the footer .twig template from Pattern Lab into the corresponding .twig template inside of Drupal and then replacing block content with content. So what's happening here is if we looked at the block layout page, and we had the footer region. Any blocks that you added into that are automatically going to get printed out inside this content bread because it's going to hold all that information. An embed, again, is the, kind of the best of both worlds. Here I have the ability to, this is a, a simple layout component called section that has some optional things, like it, like it has an optional title, it has an optional post script section. Like think of like if you want to put a button at the bottom of the section. Uh, and then I have my twig block for my content, and then anything that goes in here is going to be able to print out. And so you have this lovely section element with an optional title, an optional postscript, and then a content section. And the nice thing about this inside of Gesso is you have the ability to also pass a constraint to us. If you want to full bleed, constrain. And inside of Gesso, if something is constrained inside a constraint, that constraint is ignored. So it knows it's smart enough to know that it's already inside something that's being constrained. So in those previous example, <coughs> examples, we were calling that section twig, le twig uh, layout from Pattern Lab, which re replaced that embedded tag with a markup. Okay, so different scenarios we're going to be using these different things inside of um, Pattern Lab and Drupal 8 when you're integrating it would be with a node. Which obviously, sometimes you'll hear reference as an entity. Um, this works with various types of entities, so Drupal nodes, blocks, paragraphs, custom blocks being the most common. All content on a Drupal website is stored and treated as a, a node or entity. So we can consider a node any piece of individual content, such as a basic page, which we're all familiar with. <coughs> um, category of data that can be added to an entity, such as a title, we saw that example, we, we <coughs> include. But other places where you might see us being referencing content would be obviously with a taxonomy term reference, maybe a media reference. And then one thing to keep in mind is that any type you print content by itself, and when we're using this integration, you're going to get a field template automatically from Drupal that gets pulled in. And so my recommendation would be not to just blindly print content when you're dealing with Pattern Lab, because in most cases, you're wanting to say, hey, this gets passed to where I want the heading to be. This is getting passed to where I have maybe these taxonomy terms um, neatly themed. This is where I want the body of this content to be passed. Here's a paragraph type that I, that I know is going to come at me already themed. So in those situations, what you're really wanting to do is reference the field directly. Still doesn't fix the issue with the field template. However, if you do use something such as twig field value module, which is part of Gesso, you have the ability to pass a twig filter to this, which says, hey, when you go to print out this body, only grab the field's value. 
okay? Which returns, in most cases, a string, unless it's like a complex array, then you can deal with that. And then here's an example of like a card display mode where we're passing the title, the content, and the image. All right, a couple more slides. Um, these slides will be available too, by the way. So twig field value it also allows you to check for things like, hey, is that field empty or not? And if not, go ahead and then pass the field value. Otherwise, pass false, so we'll be able to do conditional things inside of TimeLab. Uh, twig tweak, I'd say this would be part of any uh, themer's toolbox, because uh, it allows you to do things like print the block, print a node with the ID and a display mode, which comes in really handy. Also allows you to print a view with the view name, the display name, and as well as pass arguments to it. So you start opening this endless world of things that you can do. Um, it also allows you to you know, set here these things inside of variables. For us, so in this case, an example right here, we have like this resource field coming at us that has multiple taxonomy terms, and we have the ability to actually use stuff like that. So I know this was a lot of information I covered today. Um, we only have a couple of probably minutes left since I heard everybody over the next door laughing. Any questions? You can open the door just talk if you want. I can actually see hands. <laughs> yes? Uh, not so much. Uh, just a, uh, a question about the sort of uh, oh, great, but there's one called value if you're like trying to deep dive. Ahead. Right, that was the twig field value, and I made a, went over this a little too fast. Uh, no, it's it's actually the, it's called the value module. Oh, the value module. Like, yeah, where it does like uh, it does underscore content type as a variable. Okay. Uh, and then it basically, like if you're trying to grab the the SRC out of, out of an image, and you don't want to do that, especially if you're in like a medium using me, the media module, you want don't want to have to deep dive. So yep. The value module is like uh, a way stripped down set of the values you get out of the node by default. Nice. It's really handy. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm kind of a YouTube pattern, but I, you know, a lot of my clients like to use the district four. So is it, how much effort is that? So, yeah. so I'm a, I'm a, you could try to make a bootstrap, there's probably one out there, a bootstrap version of Pattern Lab. The, the challenge with foundation, with bootstrap, is you're inheriting somebody else's technical debt. Meaning, you probably really only want to use bootstrap for foundation for probably 25% of what it uses, but you're forced to having to use 100% of it. And you're also locked into their naming conventions, which in a lot of cases, to me, I don't want to have to worry about it being 12, call, 12 dash tall, 6 dash medium, 3 dash small, or however that works, because I've stopped looking at it honestly. <laughs> I'd rather have, and this just so provides us a lot of this stuff for you, there's already a grid layout. All you got to pass to it is L dash grid dash dash 3 call, 4 call, 6 call, whatever call, how many columns. It uses CSS grid with a flexbox fallback, so it's all, like, already following best practices. So. I generally would talk a client out of using Foundation or Bootstrap unless this is like a five-page brochure where site that you just need to get out the door if it's something that's more complex. Even if it's a smaller project, I think Cotton Lab is the place where you take a look at because it, it locks you into best practice standards. Did that help answer? Oh, yeah, I was more like looking. So, you know, because actually, no matter what, the booster was very popular among a lot of the uh, well known, so yeah. they actually bring it first. So, this is my first time actually I heard about the Jesse thing. Yeah. So, I'll look into it. But yeah. yeah, and feel free. Um, so, my email is up here. It's chaz.chumley at pixel.com. That's the GitHub repository for, an actual, for the actual training I do. You got, uh, people oh, are welcome yeah, to go yeah. grab that and play around with it. It's a self contained land over the Dockerized Drupal 8 instance with Pattern Lab already in it. And then, uh, if you have, need to reach out for any type of services, uh, Bixel.com. We're always working on great projects with great clients. Thank you. Thank you.